Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Leo. I'm here with my uh, friend Imran for a conversation about um, how different product development stages and organizations, uh, topologies, or maybe team sizes, affect the way we define governance models. We'll talk uh, about some important practices and tools to design a lightweight model. But first, Imran, what do we mean by architecture and governance in this context? So I'm gonna borrow from someone that's a lot cleverer than me. So Neil Ford defines architecture as uh, four, four key parts, right? So it's the important technical decisions. It's the structure or style of processing. It's the, the famous non-functional requirements or architecture characteristics. And it's also the guiding principles where the guiding principles encode some of the organizational values around how, how we should build software. Architecture governance, um, is really the series of activities that ensures that we do those things well. Um, so decisions, fulfillment of architecture characteristics. So as, as the organizations get larger and products get more complex, this becomes harder to do. Um, and there's this healthy tension between uh, local autonomy and alignment. Um, and how you do this fundamentally affects the way that you do architecture governance. Nice, nice. So. Um... Then how important is modeling architecture governance and get it right instead of uh, maybe not doing or getting wrong? So, so I think we've all experienced bad, ar bad architecture governance. So mm -hmm. decisions are slow, absent, uh, or worse still, they're flip-flopping. So they're changing constantly. They're centralized. And often there's different decisions in different parts of the organization. And again, this gets worse as the organization scales. By contrast, good architecture governance scales uh, with the organization and the product complexity. Um, as you increase the number of people, people continue to feel empowered to work autonomously and make local decisions aligned to global principles. Um, and the people that are involved in the architectural governance um, have the necessary controls in place to be able to verify with confidence that things are aligning. Okay, very interesting, man. So um, what are those product stages you meant before and how they influence the model design? Yeah, so there's, there's a whole variety of different product lifecycle models. The one that we borrowed is Kent Beck's 3X model and it characterizes product lifecycle in three different stages and you can see them on the screen now. Um, and he posits that um, depending on what stage of the product lifecycle you're in will determine what types of software practices you should adopt. Um, and adopting the, diff, uh, the, the incorrect practices at different stages can actually be counterproductive. So similarly, um, I, I, th I think that as the product life cycle changes, it also um, dictates that the architecture governance model should also change. Um, as the product strategy and business objectives change, there's a need to adapt um, to different team structures, budgeting, non-functional requirements. And obviously the architectural governance practices and processes need to evolve accordingly. Okay, get it, get it. So let's um, simulate some different scenarios or, or maybe personas based on those factors that we just talked about. And um, let's see how governance will look like in those cases. So cool. let's, let's start with um, like tech oriented startup. Uh, let's say I'm starting my product development and I'm doing a lot of experimentation. Uh, maybe with a lot of feedback from my uh, small customer base so far, right? So let's say I'm on the size of five uh, multidisciplinary teams doing, let's say, brute force development, not paying too much attention to NFRs and, and more, more attention to validating my uh, high business hypothesis and looking for a market fit. So which model and tools do you recommend in these cases? So in this situation, the, the degree of uncertainty is really high, right? Uh, as, you've, as you've described, um, but the tolerance for change is also really high at this stage. Um, the resource allocation is, is pretty scarce. So you might not have a dedicated architect playing this, uh, that, that particular role, but is architectural governance necessary? I would argue that it's still necessary at this point, though it might take a slightly different form. Um, things to note at this point is I think it's important to make good one-way door decisions so that you don't get yourself into situations that are hard to navigate later on. It's important mm -hmm. to start to make uh, good decisions with trade-offs in mind, and it's important to start to document some of those things. Start to think about clearly articulating the problems that you're solving and also being exhaustive in evaluating different options um, 
that 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 might uh, cater to specific uh, problems. Um, and doing this will serve you well in the future. Some tools to consider at this stage are um, ADRs or architecture decision records, um, and also starting to use tools like the technology radar to start to align what type of tech choices we we as a team want to. Um, uh, adopt and also starting to do tech huddles, right? As a way to regular tech huddles to um, regularly review these. Okay, so now let's say I'm a little bigger than that. I am now a scale up, getting investment money, spending quickly with my proven product. My org is now somewhere five, is scaling to maybe 15 teams and still doing quick on the ground decisions. Uh, I'm still keeping very fluid tech. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm moving my product from initial brute force uh, to a maybe strategic, a more strategic architecture. But as I have product already there in production with some important customer base, the impact of the change is not minor. So in this case, what are your recommendations, man? So if you've gotten to this stage, you're lucky, right? Um, you've got fun funding from, uh, from, from um, VCs, you've got uh, customers that are actually using your your, your product and they have confidence in what you're doing. The flip side is that you've got more people looking at what you're doing, right? And there's a higher expectation. So Kent Beck describes this stage as the expand stage. And it's really going and, and looking at how to scale both the software systems, but also the organization that supports it. And again, architecture governance needs to keep up. So how do you scale? So there's a couple of different things that you can do at this point. Um, one of them is the guiding principles that we spoke about earlier. And, and that will really allow the team to work independently. Um, and that's obviously very important for scaling. It's also important to think about how can you align those principles to the business objectives? Uh, they should really be driven by the business objectives. And then the practices that you would adopt, the software practices, they should also align to the guiding principles, the architectural guiding principles. And making sure that you define those well will provide a paved road for developers and others to actually go down the right path and make that easy. Another thing to consider is around this notion of paved roads or paved paths is really to start to bake some of the best practices and some of the key decisions into some kind of internal platform, which will reduce the surface for misalignment. Um, at this point, it's also very common for teams to start to move from monoliths to microservices and, and for, for reasons of scalability. And so at this point, when you're starting to move to a slightly different architecture, start thinking about adopting evolutionary architecture um, and, and thinking about how you can move to a different state while preserving your important architectural characteristics. So fitness functions would be something else that you might start to consider at this point. And finally, again, start to have regular architecture review meetings if you haven't already at this point to start to align across the different teams. Okay, so up to now I have, in both cases, you mentioned about ADR and as a recommended tool. So how can I use it well and take advantage of this tool? Yeah, so architecture decision records are a fairly well adopted um, tool across the industry. Um, I won't go into detail on what architecture decision records are. You can definitely find out about them. But for those that have used them, I think a couple of things to keep in mind. Firstly, keep them succinct. Um, treat them similar to stories, right? So think about slicing them in the right way. Make sure they're small and focused. Um, introduce uh, fact-based thinking when you're actually writing these um, to keep them objective. And finally, think about readability, right? So ask, your, ask yourself, will this make sense to me in six months time? These I think are really important. Okay, so now let's get into a large enterprise scenario, right? So let's say um, I have like to say 15 plus teams now and I'm on the modernization journey that involves many business units. And on this journey, I'm migrating from my legacy platforms into a more modern setup and reevaluating many of my architecture decisions, right? So also incorporating maybe new NFRs that would allow me to scale my product, which by the way, it is in production supporting a large number of our clients base and still needs to be maintained until the new replacement comes. So as I see many companies in these scenarios, uh, I'm curious to hear what you have to say to them. So I think at this point, you're, you've got this interesting situation where you've got two different products really almost. You've got one, which is the business critical application that's been returning you consistent returns for many, many years that you need to continue to nurture. And then you've got the Greenfield product, right? And both of them have, uh, you, you might actually start to have to make new decisions and you might even have to define different guiding principles, right? So you're moving from one state to a different state. Um, 
and you need to preserve or exceed the NFRs as you've already talked about. And there's a lot of uh, people looking at what you're doing, right? The boards are really interested in these large complex uh, programs because they're such a big investment. So what can you do to make your life a little bit easier uh, from a governance perspective? There's a couple of things. So firstly, I think defining like product roadmaps or architecture roadmaps and clearly defining what are the milestones from going from one state to another state becomes really, really important. So I think that's a really important tool to start to adopt. I think the other thing that you might need to also start to think about is introducing architecture review boards, right? The, the size of the teams have increased so significantly that you probably don't know the people on other teams. And so this is an interesting uh, pivot point because you're starting to make trade-offs, right? You're starting to go from uh, favoring autonomy to alignment. And, and, and there needs to be that necessary trade-off just because of the size and complexity of the program. And then finally, I would say that although you need to start to introduce some of these things, you should still focus on uh, architecture guardrails as the way to scale, as they'll ensure that there's a smooth flow of work and um, a certain group of people don't become the bottleneck. Okay, so let's say, let's get into the merging and acquisition for a sec. So um, I, I have acquired or merged with other companies. I'm combining my um, heavy number of uh, teams supporting the different products from both companies. And let's say they could be either complementary or, or redundant in some cases, but the big thing is that they are very technically, let's say heterogeneous. So I find myself on a journey of uh, combining both worlds. And in this case, what should I do? So this is an interesting situation again, because you've got two disparate organizations that are really merging together and you've got two sets of tech decisions. You've got two sets of NFRs, guiding principles. How do you how do you, what do you deal with it in a situation? So often organizations are really interested in integration and standardization at this point uh, as key business objectives. So the key at this point is to start to think about rationalization. So how do I start to deduplicate some of those uh, duplicate decisions and technologies uh, so that you can start to realize operational efficiencies and also reduce your architectural complexity? So a couple of things. Firstly, it's important to understand the architectural profile of the product that you've just acquired understand what the level of misalignment is between what you want, what you as the uh, acquirer want and what, what you've inherited. And then also start to think about the maturity of that architectural product as well. And once you've under identified that gap, you can start to use uh, roadmaps and, and the like to start to move to a, a better state. The other thing to think about is architecture scorecards. So start to do assessments um, on, on some of the, on the product that you've acquired. And the other interesting thing that you might choose to do is start to do some archaeological activities where you interview folks to rediscover some of the lost decisions um, that from the acquired product. Okay, so that's that's very true. And uh, the last scenario, it is, let's say I'm, I'm a large BAU. So I'm a large company with established product in the market for, for years. And I do have many internal stakeholders and a large backlog that may include like new features uh, and to keep up with the product with um, uh, the ever-changing business, but also some bugs and technical improvements. I need to keep the lights on and the application healthy as my, ma my main goals. So what architectural governance would you mean here? So the product life cycles changed again, and Ken Peck would describe this as the extract phase, right? So it's low capital investment, but there's stable, consistent earnings that are happening. So at this point, I think quality is the most important thing from the business perspective. And by that, I mean low defects, no outages. That's usually the, the mantra. Um, and in terms of changes, it's like things like security, compliance, regulatory requirements that, that are really driving a lot of the changes. Um, however, like architecture governance is still relevant at this point. And so I think it's important to continue to have regular reviews and audits, uh, working with teams that are responsible for operational security, regulatory and compliance um, uh, needs of the, the product. Um, and, and ensure that you continue to do that. And then finally, I think it's important to think about, hopefully at this point, you've, you've built an arsenal of tools and practices that we've talked about previously um, to start to make maintenance a lot, an, an easier task for everyone. So, um, and if you haven't adopted some of these products, then maybe it's time to start to consider using them to make your life easier. Okay, okay. So now that we talked about like the large enterprise and, and the tradition of uh, architects and many teams on, as part of organization, how can I use the uh, architecture review boards to avoid the ivory tower and gatekeeping practices on, um, as part of the architecture decisions? Yeah, so these meetings can often be arduous uh, for the people that are attending them. And, and I think there's a couple of things that you can try and do to make them less arduous and more 
uh, focused on outcomes um, and, and make it less of a, a difficult process. So, so the techniques you can do is moving away from gatekeeping. So making the reviewers less mm -hmm. gatekeepers and more facilitators. And then also starting to think about how you can co-own the outcomes around some of the decisions that are being made here. So get architects and developers to work together to have collective ownership around decisions. And then the, the last thing I'd mention is that um, often we think that there's two outcomes. It's either approved or, or um, uh, rejected. Approved with remediation is often a much better outcome for everyone than failing. So I, I think that's another uh, technique to consider. Okay. Thank you, Iran, for uh, it was great to hear from you and, and the, these are the key learnings that I took from it and I hope that you keep them as well. Uh, for me, it's pretty clear that architecture governance adapts as your um, architecture and like the product architecture and also the product stage evolves and that we need to always keep an eye on autonomy versus alignment balance. Um, that's all, so thank you for, for listening to us. Uh, we are available by email or social media for any follow-up questions and uh, comments. Please reach out to us and um, have a great rest of Expo. Thanks, everyone. Scott.